Hi everyone. I'm having to sit very close to the camera so that it can pick up my audio thanks to my very low-tech setup out here, simple tech. So I just wanted you all to get a glimpse of this place. This is one of my favorite places in Maryland when I'm here. And it's a place where I'm often bringing classes this time of year in the spring, small groups of people to feel the magic and the wonder of this place. And it's not the same over video. <laughs> I struggle with that. I think I sat here for like an hour thinking about how I was going to do this video and dissatisfied and feeling like, oh, now I got a stomach ache and now that cardinal's being too loud and maybe I should just go home and I don't want to talk about garlic mustard and um, just tangled up in knots on the inside. But here's a little here, making the video with 40% battery left. We'll see how much we get here. Um, so, you know, yeah, where to start? Where to start? <sighs> Let's start with the plants. So, this particular area, it's just a little speck of woods, honestly. Like, there's a road not that far back that way. You might even be able to hear it. There's a really well used hiking trail path, like a five or ten minute walk up that way. And somehow this little scrap of woods, which I mean you could walk in an hour in that direction and be in heaven, um, there's never anyone back here. It's so strange. Um, it makes me wonder, like what, did, what has happened? Like you, it could be, you know, a parking lot full of cars down there, you know, overloaded to the max and hikers walking this straightaway trail that's like paved and straight. It was an old railroad track. So it's just like, you might as well be walking on a road and it can be full of people, crammed with people and not a soul. I could be in here for hours, day after day and not see a soul. So, uh, sometimes I'm just like, <laughs> People, humans, humans, what happened to you? Like, what happened that you forgot? Like, that you forgot that you love to crawl and roll and crawl through thickets and, and hang out with birds and dig in the ground and eat flowers. Like, what happened? What happened? Well, right now, I don't know if you can hear it, but it's coming from that direction, way up in the trees there. There's a blue-gray gnat catcher squeaking. Just did it again. They sound like a squee, 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 squee. They sound like mice. They sound like little mice in the trees. And this time of year, for the past few weeks, everywhere I go, like all of the trees in the woods are just filled with blue-gray gnat catchers. These teeny, teeny little birds, and they they hop around so fast. They're like bluish gray. They hop around in a tree so fast that you can almost tell just from afar that it's a blue-gray gnat catcher because they're just <laughs> like that. Their speed. Their tininess and their speed hopping around in the branches will cue you in, and then this very white eye ring around their eye. It's very noticeable. And and they sound like mice. Sounds like there's mice in the trees. Blue gray nut catchers. And they're just some of my favorites. I just love having them around. And uh, there's been a cardinal right in these privet bushes, just belting it out for, <laughs> for like an hour earlier. Um, one, been hearing one northern perula off in the distance. 
sometimes it'll be like a or a beep. It's two calls that I love so much. And there is one magical morel mushroom right over that way. It's the first one that I've seen this season. I just haven't, I haven't come upon morels. And uh, I walked around before doing this video when I was feeling frustrated. And it's just right over there. It's like huge. It's like this big. It's huge. Just like right next to a garlic mustard flower looking beautiful in a little slice of heaven. <laughs> so beautiful. So if this were, you know, if this were like two weeks ago, we would be showered in pink right now. Like all these trees, all these large trees behind me with the scaly bark. These are all wild crab apple trees. And this whole open area is just filled with them. And right around the time the ornamental cherries were blooming in the city, these wild crab apples out here were just just canopies of pink and pink flower petals falling down all upon the brown ground here just like this place is titillatingly heart-stoppingly beautiful in the early spring it's like aphrodite just unveiled her essence onto the planet uh, so it's one of my favorite places to come in the spring i've been coming here all the time for years whenever I'm in Maryland. Um, as I may have mentioned, I call it the garden. And even though we're right in between a road and a main hiking trail, um, in what honestly was probably a timber farm, a pine, pine timber farm, there's even a lot of remnants of areas that are still mature pine trees that were planted in rows. Strangely enough, white pine. And then in these open areas, the wild crab apples have really come up and matured. There's a lot of fairly large um, black walnut trees. A shockingly large uh, little grove back there of Kentucky coffee bean trees. Like, fairly big size, fairly mature, big trees. And uh, lots of hackberry, Celtus occidentalis hackberry. And so much black haw, the viburnum, prunifolium, and right now it's blooming. The crab apples have finished blooming. There's little remnants of their petals all over the ground. Just, just remnants. Their fruit has set, hopefully. Probably. Wild crab apples are just the toughest of the tough. Uh, wild crab apples and calorie pears. They got some shit to teach us about wildness and toughness in these drastically changing spring seasons with late frosts and early warmth and they're teaching us something about they will set fruit when few other trees will but right now all the black haws are just starting to bloom so walking around the shrub layer there'll be these saucer shaped sa saucer sized clusters of little white flowers almost like Queen Anne's lace on a shrub or a small tree and they are heart-stoppingly beautiful. They're like mother. It's like when, when the great mother, mother and grandmother, make their appearance in the woods here. To me, that's what Black Haw is. It's just, ah, oh, it just feels like lace inside the heart. Goodness gracious. And uh, just because of all this particular arrangement of plants, this particular area, is so food rich pretty much all year long all the time in spring it is a carpet of wild greens and beautiful flower petals and gosh and then by fall you know it's rose hips out the wazoo wild grapes wild crab apples the black haw fruits the um, hackberry fruits the uh, black walnuts like it's just crazy array of food all the time and it's so open in here it's it's strange how open it is you can walk around um, it's like a being in a little fairy kingdom land and then you can walk downhill 
eventually get to water, walk through, muck your way up to your knees through the water and the mud, through kind of a wetland area. See some shy ducks. Sometimes there's wood ducks down there. And then follow that and continue on to the large expanse of river bottom that opens up, which right now is just just filled with sochan, wild sochan leaves this tall and bright green, and the nettles down there, tall and thick, black willows, old black willows just hanging out, and um, it's just its own wonderland down there. But we're up in kind of the higher ground in these woods that I call the garden. Uh, and Amazing how much my heart just falls. <laughs> it's just it's this video stuff sometimes. Sometimes I'm pumped up about it, and right now my heart is just like, I just want you to touch them. I just want you to be able to, like, touch these leaves, you know? Like, I want you to be able to be here to touch this and to smell this and to feel this. Um, to be able to, like, play around in the garden like children. Like, I'm just <laughs> totally crying. I mean, it's paradise. It's paradise in here. And no one comes in here, for the most part. There's so many deer, so many birds, so many animals. It's just amazing. You know, I spend so much of my time in my life, and particularly as a plant teacher and a person who spend so much of my time and energy loving on plants and experimenting with them and teaching about them really just welcoming people into the garden you know I'm just like don't be afraid just come and play like just come and play you'll remember as soon as you get here you'll remember that you love this that you love this this is what you were born for this is this is in your blood your blood and your skin is green and you don't even remember right now but you'll remember as soon as you get in here You'll remember. Uh, why do I even say that? Oh, yeah, just that I spend so much of my time in life um, on the defense because I love plants. You know, on the defense against. the impact, the constant, unrelenting impact of pain. Because of them, because I'm so close to them, because I feel at home here, like because I feel like a little kid at home here. Um, and you know, here's garlic mustard, like one of my favorite wild greens of spring. When I'm up in the mid-Atlantic area, like, I remember, oh, like, it's garlic mustard. Like, when it starts to rise from these short plants in the spring and it starts to form its little flowering stalk. They look like little broccolinis or broccoli rab. The little teeny flower cluster on the top that's green and not opened. You know, when the stalk starts to rise. Oh, it's springtime and it's one of my favorite vegetables. Just plucking the flowering stalks when they're small and short. Like little broccolinis, just snap those right off, just like you're snapping asparagus or or a broccolini. And um, you know, I think I get tired. I get so tired from childhood, from being a little baby, up until now. So tired of just guarding, guarding against knife of hatred, of hatred, um, of knowing, of as soon as I put up my hand and openly say, I love this plant, like, I love this plant, like, I live, I would die for these plants, you know, um, it's as soon as I do that, oh, I love, I love. But 
as soon as I say I love, you know, I can be shot down with that plant doesn't deserve to live. That plant doesn't deserve to live. Um, that's so prominent. That's so prominent and prevalent in this imaginary, politically charged, imaginary, hateful field called invasiveness. all of a sudden we as humans, angry humans, scared humans, frustrated humans, desperate humans, have an outlet, right? Oh, the government told us these, we're allowed to blame these ones, so we will, right? I mean, German government said, you're allowed to blame the Jews and the gypsies and the handicaps and you're allowed to blame them it's their fault they suck and how many people are so willing to jump along with it like oh great we're allowed to hate yeah we're gonna hate now like all the hatred that's bubbled up all the fear all the confusion all the desperation all the struggling can bubble up right and just pour out you know to say that we hate we hate. And to say that you love, like, to do this, to, to love all of these things, to love wild springs that can be destroyed. I have loved certain, there's a certain spring, a wild spring in North Georgia I have loved since I was born. One of my holy places that my grandmother, she's not one of my blood grandmothers, but she's a southern woman who was my third grandmother growing up in Georgia. And um, she had known that spring throughout her young life when she was a little girl. And she would tell me that when her mother would take her up to that cabin, the first thing they would do when they would get there is go out to the back where the spring was and brush away the leaves from the silt and fill up a little pot of water from the spring. And that would be our, our, our coffee water and our drinking water. You know? So maybe that spring has been around for a <laughs> hundred years or a thousand years, right? And I had to live through watching that spring be destroyed by someone. And now that spring no longer flows. And I feel that. It's impossible. I cannot but, I cannot but feel the ripple of that throughout my whole body whole spirit and whole soul. Like, I will still cry about that spring. Obviously now, thinking about it. Um, you know, I have had to see the destruction of so many kingdoms throughout my lifetime. From when I was a little, little, little human. A little, little thing. Till now, and it never stops. Kingdoms of... As a kid, I had a wisteria kingdom inside it was like wisteria held me protected me and I have loved her <laughs> always she protects me still my kingdom was destroyed and many, many more large meadows, huge acreages, rolling meadows full of ancient old apple trees and blackberries. And, you know, I've seen rivers, streams straightened. There's a park here in Baltimore in Maryland. You know, it's a big park. They got great funding. 
Lots of people go there. It's a great place to walk around. There's hundreds of acres to explore, woods, and it was an old it was an old uh, homestead, old farmland. And so some of it is kept open field. Some of it is woods, and there's a stream there. And I love going there. And I feel the unhappiness of that stream in my own body. Even just thinking about it, when I'm around it, I certainly do. You know, the stream was straightened, right? So huge stones, boulders were brought in and lined along both sides of the stream all the way down the whole length of like huge square cut boulders, right? So that it runs like a highway. It can't meander, the shorelines can't change. There's not completely natural shorelines and the water runs too fast now because it's a freeway, right? Water can't meander. to see streams straightened. It'll tear you apart. And I know this garden may one day fall. This could easily, in a snap of a finger, be gone. I know that. I know that about every place I love. I know that. And I still love. And I come here. I come here and I teach people here and I teach people how to love. Like, how to love all these little green things that are beings beyond compare. That bear the brunt of violence. It's so easy to enact violence on the ones that are smaller than you, weaker, that seem more defenseless, right? That's why the abused, abused humans who are abused tend to abuse younger siblings, any, any type of abuse at all, you know, younger siblings or just any other humans that appear weaker. They're acting out the abuse, the trauma and the pain of that think as a whole world, as a whole species of humans, we do that. And we, we do do it on the animals and the plants and the birds and the water. God, we do it on the water. Yeah, so this is a plant that I love. It's a plant that I will not rip up plant that I will not teach anyone ever to hate. And if it weren't here, something about spring would be missing for me. It would be missing. So I do want to show you something. <laughs> I, need to show, I wanted to show you something very practical and important. And um, it's a great opportunity to do it. This leaf is very tender. Look how bright lime green it is. It's almost translucent. It's just very tender. I'm not going to do some special video about garlic mustard and some special video about nettles. This whole place is just filled with stinging nettles. Tall Urtica dioica stinging nettles. It's one of the best nettling areas. You could nettle for hours and hours in here. I do usually in the spring, day after day after day after day, harvesting tons of nettles. One of the best nettle spots around. Um, yeah, I'm not going to make some special videos on both of those. These are both well-known plants. These are widely known wild edible plants. There's so many videos and books and everything about them. I'm not going to sit here and add to that. You know, here, I'm Victoria. Here's my own version of stinging nettle video. Here's my own version of garlic mustard video. Hey, you can eat it. Guys, no. And um, I will just say that what I'm talking about with Meristem, is in this book by Sam Thayer, Nature's Garden. It's one of the greatest books that exist on wild plants of, uh, it applies to the whole mid-Atlantic region here. Um, you know, he's writing up in the northern part of the Midwest, um, 
so it applies up there really well. It even applies to the northeast pretty well and to a surprising amount of the southeast. So if you're anywhere on the east coast and midwest and you're trying to learn wild plants, like, get this book. Get this book, guys. And read the section on meristem. It's important. Um, you know, and I will just say that, you know, if you're learning about all the wild plants and how to eat them, how to just, for God's sake, come home. How to come home. And remember that, like, You were born to be here. You were born to, you were born for these thickets of nettles and garlic mustard and morels, you know, for God's sake, just to come home. You're coming out of, you know, the cement walls and the schools and the bullying and abusive places and learning how to come back home, remembering that you can come home you're learning, just remember, like, the reason we have books like this, and the reason there are teachings about all the wild plants, and that there are people who still know about them and can teach about them, is because they were taught by their teachers. And the reason that exists is really just because of, like, some handfuls of badasses, like, real badasses who dedicated their lives and energy and even risked their lives to hold on to these things. You know, even like Yule Gibbons, like badass, okay? Like teaching his whole life, writing his whole life. Juliette de Berkeley Levy, you know, just all the, so in North America versus in Europe, you know, all the Native Americans, all the different indigenous groups in North America, holding, just fucking trying to survive, just sur just staying alive, surviving, okay? And with that, holding on to every little bit of intact tradition, way of being human, of what makes it worth being alive, meaning all the relationships with the plants, all the skills, and in Europe, the gypsies of Europe just fucking staying alive when everything around them and all the cultures around them would have had them obliterated. And with them, all the herbal knowledge of Europe about how to use the wild plants for so many things, right? Just staying alive. And through the Holocaust, those that stayed alive and fled to New York. To, to the United States, um, and who were able to teach Juliet to bear, Juliet de Berkeley Levy in Europe, who's dedicated her whole life to gathering the knowledge of the plants, bringing it to the U.S., basically starting Western herbalism in the U.S. People like Rosemary Gladstar and all these great herbalists here in the U.S., they were students of her who was a student of the gypsies and the Berbers and the Bedouins and the Tinkers. So don't take this stuff for granted, you know? Like, Sam Thayer worked really goddamn hard to write these books, okay? They are fabulous. Almost anything I could teach in an in-person class about wild edible plants in the spring in the mid-Atlantic, it's already in here, guys. Just read it, sit down. I know books aren't popular these days, for God's sake. We need to get off the frickin' devices, you know. Enough of this, take a picture of it with your iPhone thing, and your iPhone tries to ID the plant. It's wrong. Um, I believe in the old ways, and I teach the old ways. Um, so, don't take these kinds of books for granted. Okay, there are so many skills out there, traditions out there, secrets that died, that were buried with the people who died with them or things that you could only learn by traveling to some remote place in Greenland to learn from, you know, some last remaining elder, if they would even talk to you, you know, you stuck up stupid American, like, there are so many things that are lost, and that's real, and that these things that are not lost completely, like, 
So I'm just saying, you know, have some respect and put in the time. Sit down, read the stuff. There's high, high quality books out there, resources out there, teachers out there. Just with open hearts welcoming you into coming back to the garden, coming back to the kingdom. So meristem just means the tender portion of plants, tender leaves, tender stalks, the new growth. It's bright, shiny, green stuff. It's tender. It's the most tasty. And, um, you know, I just noticed that um, it seems like a lot of people aren't aware of that, aren't getting that when they're learning wild plants on their own. So we're going to take a look with garlic mustard and stinging nettle. Because um, I know with garlic mustard, people, you know, they wait till the stalks are like this big and blooming or finished blooming with seeds on them. And then they're just like plucking the lower leaves and be like, oh, great, I harvested some wild green. They'll take this home and make pesto. And like, yeah, you can do that. But that's not really the best way to harvest vegetables, whether it's in your garden or whether they're growing wild. So I'm going to switch videos so you guys can see those up close. Um... And hopefully it's helpful. So here we are on one slope of the garden. And there is garlic mustard everywhere around here. So some really typical looking garlic mustard. It's what we're used to seeing in the woods when it's flowering. You know, people tend to notice plants once they're flowering because they're bright colors. They stand out. Um, you know, this plant is... Come on, focus. It's got those beautiful white flowers. And as you can see, it's starting to create seed pods. There we go. Right? So see those little bean things on there? So that's where flowers were pollinated. They're now forming the fruit of the plant. The fruit is every plant makes a fruit, botanically speaking. Whenever the ovum, the ovary of a flower, it's fertilized, pollinated, it swells into a, develops into a fleshy body, fleshy tissue, which houses the seed. So that fruit could be a little pod, it could be that big green husk around a walnut, it could be an apple, it could be a pumpkin, it could be anything. So this garlic mustard is already forming its fruits, its little seed pods, which is telling us that you know, it's it's on its way out. It's maturing, okay? So typically, this isn't necessarily the garlic mustard that I'm going for to eat. You can, though. Like, yeah, all these leaves still are tender. Sure, why not? Technically, it's edible. Um, but for the most part, it's starting to not be as meristem or as meristematic as the other ones. Meristem, meaning plant cells that are young, that haven't toughened and matured yet. New growth, bright green new growth. So if we go over here, it is late in the spring, so most garlic mustards are blooming, like most other wild mustards. But here's one, and you can already see it's shorter, right? It's not very tall yet, but it is forming a stalk, okay? And at the top of the stalk, it's not flowered yet. Those are the unopened flower buds, just like broccoli. Broccoli is also a mustard, so it behaves and grows very similarly. Also broccolini, also broccoli rab, also kale. All Pretty much all those garden greens are in the mustard family, just like garlic mustard. So when you're harvesting broccoli or broccolini, this is the part you're harvesting from the garden. So right now, pretty much this whole stalk, including all the leaves on it from here up, is all meristematic. It's all meristem, meaning it's tender, new growth. Shoots that are meristematic tend to snap easily, like an asparagus shoot when it's young. You know, they just snap really easily. And that's a good characteristic of meristem. So this whole shoot, I'll show you, I would just snap that whole thing. It snapped really easily. All this is like super bendy. It really bends easily. Uh, crunchy, 
snappy. So there's my vegetable, right? I'm not plucking individual leaves. Imagine this is just broccoli. So I would gather a whole bundle of these, actually, and take those home, chop them up whole, like the whole stem, right? This is all good stuff because it's tender, right? So this is the whole vegetable. And I might just steam it, steam them, a whole bunch of them whole, or chop them up and throw them into a stir fry or something. Um, pretty much every day, like one of the most common wild vegetables that I'd be eating every day this time of year. And I have been. Uh, oh my gosh, last night was garlic mustard with um, a dryad saddle mushrooms. That was so good. And wood ear mushrooms in a stir fry. It was so good. So let's just see now. Um, if we go back over here to this big tall garlic mustard. Really tall. You know, if I take it at the base here... It feels stiff. It's not gonna like snap. It's actually gonna, gonna break and bend, but it's not gonna snap crisp. This is not meristem anymore at the bottom here. Okay, the stalk has gotten tough. Um, and this flower at the top, you know, I could if I wanted to like snap this off, you know, just throw that into my food. It's all tender. Sure, why not? That's not typically what I go for. If we go over here, Here's another shorter one. There's a couple in here. It's shorter, it's squatty, it's just barely starting to flower. No seed pods on there yet. Uh, and some flower buds. So this, even though it's flowering, it's all still really tender. So this is totally what I'm going for this time in the spring. So this whole shoot here, stalk, it snaps so easily. There's my vegetable, the whole thing. I'm gonna chop up or cook this whole thing as it is and I can add it to my others here, all right? So that's that's what I'm going for as the vegetable. This is all meristematic. Imagine this is a bundle of broccoli rab or broccolini. And as humans, we pretty much treat all mustards this way. We either, you know, harvest the young basil leaves when they're tender, just like kale, um, collards and kales and all that kind of stuff. Um, or, you know, we're waiting for the young flower head to form and snapping that. And that's the case of cabbage and, um, you know, broccoli and broccoli rab and all those plants. So it's the same with other wild mustards, like all the little cardamines and creasy greens, which is the wintercress, Barbaria vulgaris, same deal. So yes, you can eat the flowers, absolutely. You know, you could even, yeah, if you just pick off that top section there. Um, but there's no need to go just picking off individual leaves and stuff like that. So there's just a simple tip. I'm going to go over and say hi to Stinging Nettle. So here we are, back up in the top portion of the garden, underneath the wild crab apple trees. One of my favorite spots here. Um, pretty much this whole area is under the shrubbery is stinging nettle. <laughs> it is just nettles and nettles and nettles and nettles. And some of it is more lush and some of it is less lush, but I'll try to find some really tender ones, even though, frankly, they're all very tender right now. So the stinging nettles in here are getting tall. You know, we could have started harvesting these about a month ago early April. Actually, they were coming up in March because we didn't, it was so warm, abnormally warm. So these stinging nettles are getting tall, just like the garlic mustard. Okay, we're not plucking individual leaves here, um, but they haven't started to flower yet. They're still just putting out new tender leaves. Come on, focus. Hmm. All right, I guess that's good enough. Um, so when I'm harvesting nettles that are this tall, I mean, earlier in the spring, I would be harvesting them when they just barely come out of the ground, and there's only about an inch. When they're tall like this, as you can see, um, I'm just harvesting the top section, just like garlic mustard. So on a stinging nettle this high, Right, I'm just picking the part that's going to snap easily. So if I want just the tenderest part, if I'm going to eat it, cook it into a stir fry, I'm actually just plucking the very, very top. 
It's not much of the plant, right? But this is going to be really tender when I cook it. Whereas if I were to snap, cut the whole stalk all the way down to the base there and try to cook it, this whole bottom part is going to be tough. After it's cooked, you're going to be chewing on it like, oh, um, your wild green dish is, uh, it's really great. You know, sarcastically, like it's really tough. All right, but just this top portion, which is meristematic, it's the young growth. That's going to be really tender when I eat it. If I were drying these for tea, you know, then I would harvest a little bit more. I would maybe come down an extra node or two. You could come down a little further. It's just preference. Because if you're making tea, it doesn't matter quite as much if it's tender or tough because you're making tea. So, you know, you could harvest that much. You could even probably eat that much. Okay, but we're really just, you know, picking the top parts of the plants here. And you can see how much brighter green, right, these young leaves are than the older leaves down here at the bottom. Right, so this is the top tender portion. Right there, right there. So there's meristem. What meristem looks like in stinging nettles and what meristem looks like in um, garlic mustard. And of course, throughout <laughs> this whole area, who do we have but the amazing, wonderful, wonderful common chickweed, which hasn't totally bloomed out yet here because it's so shady. When it's in the shade, it sticks around longer. So here on chickweed that isn't blooming yet, so it's not getting tough and seedy, it's the same deal, right? Where I can kind of pluck this whole length of stem and all of this is tender and edible and, and will be tender, not tough when I eat it. So this whole piece of plant is meristem, meristematic. There we go. There's chickweed. Okay, so the whole, the stem portion is meristematic as well. I think I may have jinxed the camera now. It's okay. So we've got our stinging nettle, our chickweeds, and garlic mustard, and we kind of can harvest them all the same way, thanks to, thanks to meristem. So read up on Sam Thayer about meristem. Trust me, it's worth it. And then you're not memorizing, you know, like, oh, which part of the plant do I eat at which time? It's not a mental thing. You can look at a plant and be like, okay, I know this is an edible plant. What part looks really tender right now? What part looks bright green, shiny, snaps easily? Because whatever part that is, that's the part that's going to be the vegetable. And if the plant has already flowered and gone to seed and created its fruits, there is no meristem left in the plant. Okay, the plant is matured and toughened up. The cell walls have toughened up. So what is edible at that point in agreeable and edible is the fruit and that could be like a bean you know a garden green bean the green bean is edible or if the pod is really mature it's just the beans inside of the pod those are what we eat okay so if we're not eating the fruit of the plant or the root of the plant if we're eating part of the green fleshy body of the plant we are okay so summing up as I was saying if we're not eating the root of the plant like a tuber or a tap root or if we're not eating the fruit of a plant like a nut like a bean pod like an apple or like a seed so if we're not eating a root or a fruit we're eating the, the fleshy green body of the plant then we're always eating meristem that's what we're always going for so, so here's our garlic mustard meristem it doesn't have to be that small be bigger. Nice garlic mustard meristem. Here's our stinging nettle meristem. Uh, chickweed meristem. Okay, so <laughs> get to know meristem. Also, before I say goodbye and run out of space, he found this adorable little nest earlier today. Just wanted to share it with you guys. I don't know what kind it is. It was fallen on the ground. No dead babies around, so clearly it was an old nest and not an accident. It's just amazing. It's so little. Inside, there's this, mostly it's grasses, 
a little bit of pine needles and grasses on the outside. On the inside, there's a totally different um, orangey brown fluff used to line the inside. Totally sure what it is, but it sure looks like sycamore seed pod fluff in there. And there's some seeds in there that are left that do look like sycamore seeds. Just amazing. And look, it's so little. This is the size of it on my hand. It's so little. So little. Oh gosh, but look. Okay, they probably are sycamore then. So here is the center part of what was a big sycamore seed fluff, which is very recognizable. So yes, whatever this bird, and there's no sycamores right in this area. It would have had to go a distance to find sycamore fluff. So clearly this was very intentional, that it seeks out sycamore seed pod fluff to line the nest with. Oh, so cute. All right, I'm totally out of space, guys. Gotta go, bye.